Well, back to what everything means. Let's, let me remind you of some of the things we've done. Uh, but at this point, are there questions that people wanted to bring up about the midterm? One's on. Well, remember back, we started with counting. Seems like a long time ago, but this is only fourth week. <clears throat> My count is right. We had seven homework problems from this section. It had things like the multiplication principle. that we still use. If you want, need to do all of k tasks, and we need to count the number of ways to doing all of them. In contrast to the addition principle, if you're just doing one of the tasks. And we talked about permutations, combinations, Well, you know the formulas for these. There's what they are numerically. And you also want to know when to use them. Are we counting the number of ordered lists, or are we counting the number of unordered subsets? Well, we have to look at the English sentences there and try to see what it is we're counting. But it's not a course on counting, it's a course on probability. So we talked about outcomes, running some experiment, the sample space, uh, events. An event is just some set of outcomes, so it's a subset of the sample space. And probability functions. and their properties. For example, um, it, in doing the problems, it has sometimes been useful to know, use the fact that for a probability function, the probability of the union of two events can be broken down as the sum of the probabilities, and then we correct for the double counting. Um, the probability of a complement. Sometimes to find the probability of an event, it's been easier to look at the complement of the event. See, uh, the probability of, to find the probability of at least one success, we look at the, the probability of zero successes and subtract from one. And others, this is not a complete list. And uh, in some cases, we had equally likely outcomes. So that the probability problems reduced to counting problems for equally likely outcomes. Well, but we know about counting from the previous section. Section 12.3. Well, that was conditional probability.
there were eight problems there. Okay. So a third of our homework problems were conditional probabilities, and uh, the crucial defining formula one that you've been using for those 15 problems, and there are also the properties. of conditional probability that we've used, uh, for example, the probability of A complement given B. Well, as in the unconditional case, we subtract from one the probability of A given B. And we talked about partitions and what the book calls the law of total probability, where we have to work things out according to how many cases we've got. And in doing this, sometimes it's been useful to organize things in the form of a tree. Maybe we pick bag one, maybe we pick bag two, however many we have, and then see in each case the probability of the event happening for that piece of the partition, and then we add them up. That's what the law of total probability says. And sometimes it's been useful to organize things in the in terms of a box showing the various things that could happen. Event A could either not happen or happen. Event B either doesn't happen or it does. And then we could can fill in the various combinations. Uh, perhaps they both happen. Well, we'll work some problems pretty soon like this. Bayes' rule has come up in a number of problems where typically we want to turn some conditional probability around. Given that the person actually did test positive, what's the probability that he did have the disease and so forth? And we also talked about the important idea of independent events. When the probability of the intersection factors as the product of the individual events. And the idea of independent events has come up a lot since. Well, and then there's the first four subsections of 12.4, random variables of what? Well, so let me remind you of some of the things that came up there. Of course, so far we've only talked about discrete random variables. In section 12.5, we'll talk about continuous random variables. Twelve point four point two were about discrete random variables. Ten point 
10 problems there. Uh, sometimes we were looking at the probabilities that a random variable equals something. Or, well, okay, for, for which the probability mass function would be the function we need. Sometimes we want the probability that the random variable oh, is in some range. Perhaps it's in the interval from 2 to 7. You wanna, how likely is that that it's between 2 and 7? And we want the cumulative distribution function. The mean, or expected value. Well, as b with some of these other concepts, you want to know both what these are and when to use them. Expected value, variance, and standard deviation. The expected value is just this weighted sum. The variance is the expected value of a related random variable. Other good concepts here. Uh, we have two random variables. We want to look at their joint distribution. I want to do a problem using that in a minute. Um, there's independent random variables. And, and the properties of these things. We have, we have a list, prop, properties 0 through 7, for expected value and variance. Property number 2, for example, said the expected value of x plus y breaks down into the sum of the individual expected values, and so forth. And finally, the binomial distribution. It's our most recent topic. Where we have so-called Bernoulli trials. Independent trials, pass-fail trials, each with the same success probability. binomial distribution. Well, the first of several specific distributions we'll talk about we'll come later to the geometric distribution, Poisson distribution, uh, exponential, normal. Okay, but the one we know now, uh, binomial distribution, so when to use it, is when we have a when we're looking at Bernoulli trials. Trials that are independent of each other. Uh, they're just yes, no trials. They succeed or they don't. And each with the same success probability. And when we have that situation, we know how to apply the binomial distribution. The probability of uh, getting exactly k successes out of n trials is given by a formula that the way we, that we need to have on our side. And the expected number of successes, n trials, and each one has expe expected probability p, and the variance. Um, 
variance of f and times p times 1 minus p, from which we can get the standard deviation. Well, let me look at some specific problems, such as the following problem that you've already done. The problem that is famous for the line bag I contains I blue balls. Remember that sentence. Which means bag one has one blue ball, bag two has two blue balls, bag three has three blue balls, bag four has four blue balls, bag five has five blue balls, bag six has six blue balls. In other words, bag I has I blue balls. Uh, this was section 12.3, number 14. Bang on. So each bag has two greens, but different number of blues. And you start by rolling a die so, so you know which bag to pick. Well, knowing what we know now, we can bring in a random variable. I mean, we did this before we had heard of random variables, but knowing what we know now, when we run this experiment, we're interested in the uh, knowing which bag we get, so we can call that x. I mean, it's a function, it's a random variable. It assigns to each outcome the number of the bag that we got. So that could be anything from 1 to 6. So it's a, it's a discrete random variable. And then we're interested in the color. So as a random variable, we can just have a one with range 0, 1. It's just yes, no. It's 1 if the ball we end up with is blue, and 0 if, if it's green. And what the problem asked for was the probability of getting a blue ball. The probability of the random variable y is 1. And I mean, probably you work this out by looking at the different cases, that the six cases that could occur. OK, but let me organize that in a slightly different way. There are six cases. X could be 1 or 2. Six of these cases. And it's a fair die. So we know the probability for each piece of this partition. Now the variable y could be 1 or 0. That is, we either end up with a blue or a green. And we can fill in probabilities for each of these 12 boxes. Let's focus on the box um, That box, we want the probability that x is 3 and y is 1. Now, 
Well, so first of all, x has to be 3. And then we want the probability that we get a blue ball given that x is 3. Well, the probability that the die comes up 3 is just 1 sixth. It's a, it's a fair die. Uh, but given that we have bag 3, OK, so bag 3 has five balls in it, right? The, the three blue and two greens. So there's a three-fifths probability that we end up with y equals 1 and a blue. OK, so that's 3 over 30. That's 1 tenth. So that goes in the box. That takes care of the x equals 3 part of the partition. And the way you did this problem was to fill in all six boxes on the top row. Okay. So I'm just going to write these in now. That box is 5 over 42. And then you added up the six pieces of the event y equals 1. And you got a probability of 0.594. And in the same way, we could look, find the probabilities for y equals 0, that is getting a green. This is 1 ninth, and of course, these two probabilities have to add up to 1 sixth. Because uh, x equals 1 event breaks down into these two pieces. Well, I'm just going to write in some 1 twelfth and 1 twelfth. That's an easier addition than clearly 1 sixth. Well, terminology here, this table is called the joint distribution. For x and y. And when we have two random variables, we have, that's an option. We can make the joint distribution table. If we had three random variables, we'd have to do it in three dimensions. We probably pref wouldn't like that. And these numbers down at the bottom, called the marginal distribution for x, marginal distribution because it's written in the margin of the table. Terrible reason. Uh, the probability that y is 0, well, it would be 1 minus the probability that it's 1, 406. So in the right-hand margin here, we've put the marginal distribution for y. Well, OK, you, you did this problem before, but Looking back on it, we can think of it as a random variable problem. And here's a new problem, not one that we've done before. But another problem with two random variables. Well, we doesn't, the problem doesn't tell us anything about what the experiment is, but it gives us the probability mass functions for each one. Assume that x and y are independent <coughs> random variables. Well, 
that makes a big difference. Over here, these two random variables, well, are they independent? And you, it's an overwhelming <laughs> reply. The answer is no. These are not independent. What y is has a, what the value of x has a big effect on what y is. Uh, if x is small, that means you have a bag with very few blues in it that reduces the chances that y is going to be 1. And to calculate it with probabilities, well, to be independent, there's, what, 12 equations that would have to hold. If any one of them breaks down, they're not independent. And, and they all break down. If you look at the, the probability that x equals 1 and y equals 1 is 1 18th, that is not 1 6 times 0.6. That's, it's much smaller, about half a second. Well, over in this problem, we're told that uh, x and y are independent. We, we get to assume that. And The range of, of x is set 1, 2, 3, and we're given these probabilities. Which add up to 1, so that's all there is. And y is either 2 or 3 or 4. And we're given this, these probabilities, which again add up to 1. So we're not looking for any other things in the range. Well, we want to know if y is going to be larger than x or not. Well, maybe and maybe not. But we want the probability. How likely is it, when we run the experiment, whatever it is, that the value we get for y, 2, 3, or 4, is strictly larger than the value we get for x, 1, 2, or 3? Might happen, might not. Well, let's make. a joint distribution table, like we did over there, only this is going to be a 3 by 3 table, because the range of x has size 3, range for y has size 3. And fill in the numbers we know, and then work out the other numbers, if we can, from the given information. So. Now let's do it. Three by three, x can be one or two or three. And we're given these numbers. Ah, so it's important that we put them in the right place. Probability that x is 1 is 0.2. That is, those numbers give us the marginal distribution for x. 
probably x is 1 or 2 or 3, saying nothing yet about y. OK, let's talk about y. It's 2 or 3 or 4. And we know the probabilities. The marginal distribution for y, the probability that y is 2, well, that's a half, 0.5. And then we have 0.3 and 0.2. And now let's fill in the other nine numbers we want to know. Now, the three numbers that go here and here and here will have to add up to 0.2. We're looking at the probability that x is 1 and y is 4 x is 1 and y is 3, x is 1 and y is 2, and those three make up their union, which is the event, x equals 1. Well, we'd have a hard time filling in those nine numbers, except for the fact that we're given that x and y are independent. Since x and y are independent, we, that means that the, the number that goes here, for example, x is 1 and y is 3, simply factors into the in this way. And these are numbers we are given. In other words, knowing the marginal distribution for independent random variables lets us fill in the joint distribution table. What goes here is 0.2 times 0.2. So we just multiply. What goes here is 0.2 times 0.3. OK, so we write that in. Uh, 0.2 times 0 0.5, 0 0.1. And it's gratifying to notice that these add up to 0.2. So it's working. Uh, OK, now the other things, OK, this is 6, uh, 9, uh, 0.15, and yep, those add up to 0.3, so so far so good. 0 0.1, 0 0.15, uh, 0.25. Adds up. That is, for independent random variables, we can get the joint distribution just from knowing the marginal distributions. If independence fails, we don't have that simple way of getting the joint distributions. We have to work them out some other way. Well, back to the problem. When is x going to be smaller than y? Well. In some of these nine cases, x is smaller. Yeah, but which ones? If x is 1, it's certainly smaller than y. y is 2 or 3 or 4 only. Yeah, so we cover those. Or if x is 2 and y is 3 or more, That is, the event x is less than y consists of these six outcomes. And so we want the probability of this event. So we add up the six numbers. Those three, which we've already added up, and we add up those two. Plus 
point one. Uh, point four five. Yeah, there's a forty five percent chance that x is going to be smaller than y. In the same way, we could find the probability that we get the same value for x and y. The probability that x equals y. Well, that happens in two of these cases. X is 2 and Y is 2. X is 3, Y is 3. OK, those of the nine, those are the only two where they have the same value. And we add up the probabilities. So that, that gives us 30%. And uh, the remaining thing that could happen is that uh, x could be larger, but only in this one case. Well, we've covered all the three possibilities, and it's good to see that they add up to 1. Well, we'll squeeze in one more. What if we knew that x is a random variable, and we know it's mean, and we know it's standard deviation? Then we can make well, let's assume x is a random variable with mean 5 and uh, standard deviation 2. OK, so its variance is 4. And we bring in a new random variable. Call it z. x minus 5 over 2. OK, so it's a random variable. Each time we run the experiment, x, we look at the x measurement, subtract 5, and take half of that. And then we'd like to know about this random variable. Well, knowing those properties, 0 through 7, of expected value and variance, lets us work, work this out. The expected value of z OK, so we're looking at the expected value of 1 half x minus 5. One of those properties says the constant 1 half just comes out in front. And one of the other properties says the expected value of x minus 5 is expected value of x minus the number 5. Ah, so the expected value of z is 0. And in the same way, our properties let us work out the variance of, uh, of z. That is, the variance of 1 half x minus 5. The 1 half comes out as 1 half squared. This is a quarter of the variance of x minus 5. And the variance of x minus 5 is the same as the variance of x. The minus 5 doesn't change the variance. And the variance of x was 4. So the z has variance 1. 
as standard deviation one. It's referred to as a, a normalized random variable for x. We've changed it to have mean zero and standard deviation one. Well, got to stop for today. Remember our special events for this week. <laughs>